My name is Jordan Weaver. And I'm Lacey Weaver. Thank you so much for joining us, whether it's online or in person. Um, first thing that we want you to do is to take out your phone and download the Shiloh Ranch Church app. Because you're at a digital campus, it gives us the opportunity to interact in ways that wouldn't be possible live. Anytime there's a face on this screen, their social media will be listed. Get to know us. Follow us online. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Download the app. Uh, we're excited about the new possibilities that are coming with church these days. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. I saw something, uh, and I don't believe it, that this is back to church Sunday. When did we leave? <laughs> I don't know about that. I, don't, I think I love about your church is you're not back to church. You're in church all week, and it happens. This is just uh, an expression of what's been going on. It's good to worship together. I love behind-the-scenes people. They are the heroes. They are the people who make, make this whole thing work in the kingdom. I have a brother, I had a brother-in-law, Steve Stern. Many of you knew him. He lived in Bend for years. He was, he was never a head pastor. He was assistant pastor. He was an assist. He, his wife, Bo, my sister-in-law, was a, a really good speaker, and, and he always promoted her and, and helped her uh, accomplish what she was supposed to do. And I spoke at his funeral uh, and for a few minutes, and I, the Lord gave me this word that it, it's, it's from a French origin, but the word assist has French roots. It means to help someone stand and to assist someone. Uh, this is what we're talking about today in the story in John chapter uh, 6, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And we're going to talk about the life of Andrew a little bit, the disciple of Jesus who was kind of the ultimate behind-the-scenes guy. He was the one who, who worked behind the scenes and he helped behind the scenes. And so we have this great crisis. People, 5,000 of them showing up, more than five. I mean, they rounded numbers up, rounded them off. <laughs> there's more than what says uh, because there's men and then babies and children and they had all these people to feed well you know the story I, I want to read it in, in John chapter 6 and then we're going to talk about having relational wisdom and how, what it means to, to grow in this area John chapter 6 Jesus looked up and saw a great multitude coming toward him and he said to Philip where should we buy bread for these people to eat he asked this only to test him I mean Jesus obviously wasn't like, oh no. <laughs> For he already had in mind what he's going to do. And by the way, in our lives of crisis, Jesus isn't like, oh, what are we going to do? No, he knows. Anyway, Philip answered him, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five Small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will that go among so many? Um, I just want to stop there because uh, there's a lot to, to unpack in between the lines here because Andrew said, here's a boy. And I don't think it was just like he grabbed a boy out of the crowd. I, I would like to think that there was some time spent with that boy and Andrew somewhere on the sidelines that Andrew wasn't uh, so... I am important that he didn't have time to talk to a boy. And he, he, was, he was just like interested in him. I think he, he had the heart of Jesus there when he, Jesus said, let the little kid, kids come to me because that's the essence of the kingdom. And Andrew had a relationship and a rapport with this little boy because he found out he had food. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that's first. So anyway, he had this relationship with the boy. And then when this crisis took place, Andrew said, well, we do have this young child here. And I want to just share with you about getting it and having relational wisdom and understanding because people behind the scenes are so important. And I want you to know if I, I'm just, I want you to know that the life you lead outside of this congregation and in the world that you live in, the encounters that you have are so critical. It's the essence of the kingdom of God. It's what the Lord's all about. And so often we get focused on our big gatherings and our time together. And I want you to know that the, the real work of the kingdom is done beyond these walls. I know you know that, but I want to encourage you today 
to uh, understand. Andrew understood the kingdom was being at ease with who he was and in, in walking this out. Before Andrew was a follower of Jesus, he was a disciple of John the Baptist. And his, his training <laughs> before he became a follower of Jesus was John the Baptist, whose theme was, I must decrease so he may increase. So Andrew had this going on inside of him that he was not, he was okay not being a front row dude or a front lines person or the big picture guy. He was the one who understand the, he knew the importance of being who he was supposed to be. And he was comfortable. You know those people, they're comfortable in their own skin. You've come across them, they're just like at ease with who they are and the role they're playing in life. And I want, if you're striving today or just trying to, I want you to just kind of like, Hopefully, at the end of our talk today, the, the Holy Spirit would just give you an affirmation of, you just, I called you and who you are, and I want you to be you, okay? So, uh, we're going to try and learn about relational wisdom. I totally love the idea of, uh, of this congregation and, and your heart for planting churches and what it is to expand the kingdom into places that are not easily, uh, that can't support a, a full-fledged church as such. But you know those people are valuable in the, in the locations. And so the beauty of a church planner like Jordan and Lacey is they see something that's not there and, and want to make it happen. It's the vision of seeing something that's not there yet and this could happen. And I just think that maybe we should look at people this way. Maybe we should look at people like, you know, this is not yet, but oh boy, what could happen in their life? What could take place? What could happen in the life of my child who doesn't seem to be walking with God right now? Or what could happen in the life of my boss or my friend or whoever who just, you know, they're not, you know, they're not Joe Christian. I shouldn't use that. You, you know what? I just wished I had a different name because that's you know usually what. <laughs> anyway, I want to just kind of define having relational wisdom. It's this: the, the knack to know someone's potential, with the Holy Spirit insight to know who they really are. And just think about that for a minute. It's a knack to know someone's potential, just to uh, to have to see. I mean. Andrew brings this little boy and his loaves and fishes, but he didn't discount him. He's, this is a, you know, it's a, not very much. It's just a little, but here we have this. So he brings the boy. Uh, crisis creates opportunities if you just look around you. <laughs> in the middle of it. <laughs> this is like, oh no, there's all the people here and they're hungry. We have a mob on our hands. These weren't really uh, uh, necessarily people without selfish motives. Jesus said, they're following me for miracles. Okay, he had to escape them because they were, they were trying to just get him, you know, they were doing all the wrong things. They're just trying to get in on the, on the popular thing. But they were hungry. And so uh, selfish people that are hungry is a problem when there's thousands and thousands of them. And so this is a crisis going on. And so uh, he, you have to understand that in the middle of your crisis, in the middle of something going on in your life, look around and see what opportunity there is for you to see, maybe not a little boy, but somebody who's maybe in the mix. I, I, <laughs> I started a new business. I'm a um, bivocational Pastor, I've always been that way. I, I just don't want to not be because I, it's just more fun. <laughs> well, and I've been building houses and stuff, and that's okay, but uh, this is, uh, I thought, I tried to find someone to seal coat our parking lot at the church, and I couldn't find anybody. Nobody was around, and, and so I thought, well, we'll do that. So I got into that business. I didn't mean to, but I am into that business. And now I bought a machine, and I'm doing it. And I have workers that were going to do it. But I have one of my main workers had, a, had an elbow problem. He couldn't work. So I'm out there with this, and we're pulling the hose. You know what? I don't know if you know what seal coat is. It's black. As can, it's like 
sticks on everything. I have it on my legs right now, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> it won't come off. And so we pull, we pull uh, I had him backing up the truck. You know, pull, you know and, and the lever of the wand caught on a rock. And we're right next to a guy's building in a storefront. And the wand opened up and sprayed. This is right across from the state fair. And there's cars lined up this way and people in their fair clothes. You know, they dress in fair clothes. But anyway, they're, they're all. <laughs> and this wand is. <sighs> and the, the storefront is immediately black and the windows. And I'm thankful because it could have gotten like 30 cars. I could have done 30 paint jobs. <laughs> uh, the owner comes running out. And, and he was upset, obviously. <laughs> I was upset together with him. And we were like, oh, I'm, you know, we'll just start. We just started hosing things off and trying to make the best. And I, I said to him, I said, listen, we'll take care of this. We'll come back and paint your building. We will do what it takes. And anyway, the next morning I come back. And there he is, and he, I said, how'd you sleep last night? Because I didn't sleep very good. I was thinking about it all night long, because I just left. I said, this is enough. Put everything away. I'll come back tomorrow. And he, sa I, he said, tomorrow's Sunday. You could come back in the morning, and there won't be any people here. And I said, well, I have to go to church. <laughs> I didn't tell him my real job. I said, <laughs> he said, that's a good idea. You could go to church and say, why, God? Why? <laughs> okay, so I wound my way through, and the next day talking to this guy, how did you sleep? And he said, I didn't sleep at all. I have this, I have this problem. My, my hip is, I've got a nerve, and my wife is gone, and she took a medicine, and I couldn't sleep, and I'm just in terrible shape. I said, man, that's, that's I'm sorry. I, I, we'll be praying for you. And all of a sudden, we had this rapport. You see, in the middle of these tragedies that you're into, and everybody's life is this way, we have stuff happen. Look around and see what God is really doing. You know, because sometimes we miss what God's really doing. It's not about us. See, Andrew knew this is not about Andrew. He got that. This is what's so great about Andrew, is that he knew this wasn't all about Andrew, and it was about the kingdom of God. And so he would bring people to Jesus and connect people to the Lord, and he... Brought this little boy. So he brought the boy. And the, the boy had something. It wasn't much, but he had something. And I think we have to start looking at the potential around what people have. It, it, it's really important that we get a picture of this. Uh, in Montana, where I went, grew up in this uh, church in the north central Montana, it was a, kind of a weird little church. <laughs> it's a <on> video. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, there was a, a guy in our town named Bill Hicks, and his wife, Cossie, was, really was a follower of Jesus. She was on testimony night. She'd get up, and she, they're from the south, and she'd get up and thank Jesus, and she, her name's Cossie Hicks. And, and she, was, she was great, wonderful woman. Her husband, Bill, though, was not a believer, and uh, he had a band. He was a, a country music musician, and he had a band called Bill Hicks and the Country Playboys. <laughs> and, well, I didn't know about Bill's story, but I, 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 my mom told me the story. Well, she said, well, Bill doesn't come to church ever, and he never probably will. I said, why not? So, well, we had an evangelist come through. And he was asking everybody to come forward to get saved, you know, to get gloriously saved <laughs> versus just casually saved. <laughs> they would come to our town and they'd get off their bus and they had big hair and, and they were loud and they were emotional. And I'm not saying they didn't have fruit because some people came to the Lord because we didn't want to go to hell and it was like that kind of a deal. Well, Bill just got talked into coming and because they were musicians and he kind of liked music. He sat on the back row. Well, it was altar time. And my mom told me this story. He says, well, no, Bill didn't come forward for salvation. And a couple of deacons went back. The deacons will remain unnamed. And they picked him up by the arms and took him to the front. 
How would that feel to you? Do you think they had any relational wisdom there? Do you think they had any uh, inkling of how Bill felt? They weren't bringing the boy. They were, haul- they were dragging Bill. I don't think Andrew drugged the boy kicking a string. He had a relationship with him enough to where he could feel safe. And the boy was with Andrew. And Andrew said, here, we have a boy. So there's a, it seems like it's a slight difference, but it's massive because Bill didn't come to church anymore, and who would? And so I was now the music director of the church, and I knew my three chords on a guitar. I could fit any worship song into it, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew I needed help. So I go to Bill's house. They live in a little trailer house behind a wrecking yard over there in the other Chrysler Street, other, other side of the tracks. We have tracks. Most little towns have tracks. And then there's the other side of the tracks, since where Bill lived. And, <laughs> and I, went, I just spent, I've spent time with him for a couple of visits. And then about the third visit, I said, Bill, you know, I, I wonder if... I'm playing guitar. I said, oh, yeah, that's good. I'm glad you're playing. I said, well, it'd be nice. If we have an old stand-up bass. It'd be nice if you can play that. I love playing bass. Well, could you, would you play behind me and do that? And he said, well, I guess I could. So he comes to church and plays the bass. Okay, this man is not Christianized. Okay. But he's really good at bass. And he... He came. He, uh, he was hilarious. I wish I could borrow your guitar, but I won't. He'd get up there and play, and he had this line. He'd say, I'm, uh, I've had a lot of requests to sing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing anyway. <laughs> no, he's, I'm sorry. I said that wrong. I've had a lot of requests, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing anyway. <laughs> Somewhere in the mix. Bill came to Jesus. He did. I probably can't even tell you the day, but I just know that his faith grew, and then he ended up walking with the Lord and passing in eternity with him. See, this is a big deal that we understand that behind the scenes, your work and my work is so important that we are in line and in step with the Holy Spirit that we don't just get into our flesh and drag people, but that we love people and walk with them and listen to them and understand that they have something. They have something the Lord needs. They have something the Lord needs. And we have to get that. We have to get that. And this boy is a contributor. Um, too often we see the loss to someone who can't contribute. And we, we want them to contribute after they get cleaned up. I have news for you. You're not cleaned up either. Anybody here besides me? If you think you're cleaned up, you're really not cleaned up. <laughs> it's because you, you have to get the fact that that Andrew understood. <laughs> I am a follower of Jesus. And I want to see Jesus expand. I want to see Jesus reach people and know people. And I want to see people know the Lord. I, it doesn't even matter to me who they are or what they are. I want them to come to Jesus. I want them to know him. We just lie. We draw our lines. And we, 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 pres- we just kind of get this idea of, who would make a good follower of Jesus? When Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not the good ones or the ones that have something to, that we think they have to offer. Everyone has something to contribute. Um, we had a choir tour in our church that we first started and uh, I fell in love with my wife on choir tour so I felt like it was a a good thing so we had choir tours with youth group 
and uh, we would load up the bus. We were in Montana, and we would take a bus load of kids, and some, it grew and became kind of a popular deal because it was like a, an excursion, and we, we would go out to the Oregon coast. Every year, there was about 10 or 15 of them that had never seen the beach, and it was really a, a hoot. I was a bus driver. I'd open up the door, and they'd go running out. I said, you guys, you ready to go take a dip? And I'd open the door, and they'd go running out into the water, and, <gasps> and they come running back out. <laughs> they thought it was, you know, like Hawaii or something. <laughs> and so, but every year, we'd, 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 have, we'd, we'd just start canvassing the town. Hey, do you want to go on choir tour with us? And we'd invite kids. They weren't Christian kids, and we'd start singing songs. They were Christian songs. We'd sing them, and we had drama, little skits, and there were skits with messages, but the people carrying out these songs and these messages weren't necessarily believers yet. I always enjoyed the first couple of days because we'd find all kinds of contraband on the bus and stuff that, you know, <laughs> all kinds of, of things the kids brought with it that I thought would be fun. And, and in, the, in the middle of that, we, at the end of the tour, we'd have uh, communion time and then a time of commitment. And I, so many came to Jesus in those, in those days. And I got a cup, a, a coffee cup for my birthday from one of them who came to Christ, Austin, and it said Joseph, and it says contributor. It says it means to contribute. And I, I still have that cup. I, I, I realize that I am good enough to contribute. Do you know that you're good enough to contribute? And the enemy would lie to you. He would say, you're not, you don't have your stuff together yet. You're not someone who has anything to offer God. You're just, stay, just hope you can get to heaven. When this is not about that, it's about the kingdom of God. And it's about advancing the kingdom. And you know a whole slew of people that nobody else knows. You're connected with. And you, they need to know Jesus. And as you walk this life out, it won't take just one visit. It'll take a lifetime of connecting with people and you can assist people to know the Lord and walk with him. See, you have to understand that you're the little boy. You're the one who has something to offer. You're the one who's just there. Doesn't seem like much. That's getting it. That's having relational wisdom to understand and have a knack for someone that has potential in the kingdom of God. I used to watch Monday Night Football when they used to only have one game and Don Meredith and Howard Cosell would do Monday Night Football. I loved it. You know, turn out the lights, the party's over. And, and I remember one night, Howard Cosell said, you know, that that young man has tremendous potential. And Don Meredith says, you know, Howard, what potential means? It just means you don't have it yet. I want to let you all know you have potential. <laughs> Please get me here. I hope you understand this. God wants to use you. You are called of God. I know your heroes and my heroes are the behind-the-scenes people who get it and understand that they're doing the work of the ministry. It's what is making this happen. This move of God is happening by people who understand the miraculous power in the, in the touch of Jesus. If you just give, them, give him what you have. 
and unlock the potential in the kingdom of God. Could you bow your heads with me for a minute? I, I just I just want you to, at the end of this time, be free of shame, be free of feeling like you don't have, that you're not good enough to be used of God. God wants to use you powerfully in mighty ways that you don't know yet. So, Lord Jesus, I pray over this group of people today that your Holy Spirit would begin to break down those fears and insecurities of who we are, Lord, in you, that we could be truly ourselves and comfortable in our own skin, comfortable in walking with you, that we could be like Andrew and just walk and hope that you increase as we decrease and just connect people with you, Lord Jesus, that we would see people for what you could be in their lives. Lord, I pray for families with children that are struggling with how their kids are turning out today. I pray that you would bless them with faith, that you would, that you would encourage them with faith. It's not about making them into our image, but it's about making them into your image, Lord Jesus. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would increase our faith there, increase our faith in, in the people that we know, maybe that we're struggling with, God, would you just do a miracle? Would you just do that same kind of multiplication of your kingdom as we, as we walk behind the scenes and as we get in step with your Holy Spirit and we have conversations that you bring people to knowing who you are. In your name we pray.